Hey, seniors. How's it going? I uh, hope you're doing well. We're going to talk about shorelines a little bit. Uh, this week, we're looking at tsunamis. Next week, we're going to look at sea level rise. In order to understand the context of all of that, it's good to have some good uh, analysis of shorelines. And so, of course, this is all based on Chapter 12 of the of this textbook link here, and it's just also provided in your in Schoology for you. So I encourage you to read that. Um, we're going to go over these basic things. I'm not going to belabor it because we're going to go through this kind of quickly. Um, but do do hopefully you've seen this before you come to class on Tuesday. So you know, coastlines are essentially the boundary between land and sea. Uh, it goes without saying, but there's a lot of stuff going on over there. Of course, there's tides, waves, and so forth. To understand what's going on with tsunamis and with sea level rise in general, we have to understand and be able to distinguish between um, you know the, these various these various things going on there, these various processes, and how is the energy that's contained in a wave interacting with the shore. These are all important things. So waves basically are in the ocean. Are the you know the water itself isn't the wave. The waves are as as the waves are with with light and with um, electricity and and other things. Waves are energy propagating from a direction of some kind. So there's vector. There's a vector of motion and a vector of magnitude. And uh, we so we you know well vectors are magnitude and direction, right? So really what happens with a wave is that you know, the water itself is kind of oscillating out at sea until it encounters the solid the solid seafloor but generally speaking um the wave height or actually the wave base of course is the is the base of the is the, is the trough of the wavelength um and that is basically the, the defines the boundary of the the bottom boundary of the wave the, the water doesn't really move anywhere it just moves in a circular kind of pattern out at sea that's what we call a wave of oscillation and it's not until you get to the shoreline that you run into a wave of translation where the energy is translated into the water and, and so forth. But waves like, you know, every other wave has a wavelength and a wave height and an amplitude and so forth. Uh, and you've learned all about that before. Wave base for a wave is one half the wavelength. That's an important reality out in the ocean waves is that if you take the wavelength and you divide it by two, that gives you the, that gives you the depth of the wave base. So again, ocean waves behave like this. They're just waves of oscillation. Um, energy, the energy is moving past it and the energy just moves from left to right, but the water basically just kind of moves around in circles. There's nothing really essentially going on here beyond that. It's not until the base of the wave itself encounters the seashore or the shoreline. Um, and of course there's different wave bases, whether you're at uh, meet high tide, low tide, the wave base, um, uh, of course affects the foreshore backshore area. If you're in fair weather wave base, um, you know the shore phase zone. This is all the area that's typically um, dealing, being you know, dealing with with waves during the day. When you have storms, the way the wavelengths get bigger because you got more energy out in the water, so the wave heights get different, and the wave base gets deeper, and that's when you end up with a, with storm wave base, which is a temporary situation. Uh, and so, the geologically speaking, the sediments down here are not necessarily always being are not always being affected by waves but only being affected by waves during storm events and that's important in the rock record but it's also important here for ecosystems in that area a wave energy is basically uh, generated in a variety of ways uh, landslides volcanic eruptions meteor strikes um, earthquakes um, and of course tides are produced by the gravitational pull of the moon and of the sun and so there's a couple other things we've got the fetch which is the distance over which the wind blows that of course transfers energy into the water sorry my nose is really itchy um so wind generate waves may have been generated hundreds of miles away right and so you know these are there's different terms we can get into and all that chops white caps all that kind of stuff um, but basically the winds blowing in a relatively constant direction um, transfer their energy to the water uh, and into the water causes the energy in the water to increase and uh, we call this a wave train when they're all working together, of course. And they can carry different amounts of energy and so forth. They can also get dispersed by various things that they encounter, including spits and, and other and peninsulae and so forth along the seashore. Um, you know, so what happens is with breakers is once that energy makes its way to the shoreline, the wave base encounters the seashore and begins to push the wave upward um, through the surf zone until it crashes forward out of the beach. That's a wave of translation. And that's what's going on there. It's also what's going on during a tsunami. Um, this is not a tidal wave, though. Tidal waves are very different things. So these are catastrophic seismic sea waves, typically caused by, like, you know, volcanoes, landslides, earthquakes, that kind of thing. 
right? But they, they can have wavelengths that are really, really massive, 100 kilometers, which means your wave base is 50 kilometers, which means the wave gets really big and causes um, a lot more of the shores to get covered in water when it breaks than otherwise would. Um, and I've got a couple of videos for you to see as well. Along the coastline, there's something called the littoral zone. This is the zone near the water where it typically is affected by normal tidal types of waves. Um, and of course, where, where things are deposited. So if you walked on the seashore and you see all the little biological debris being left behind and so forth, that's you're in the littoral zone. Shorelines contain a variety of environments under normal normal daily circumstances. They're you know they're pretty consistent. During storm events, major changes can happen briefly, um, and turbidity currents are things where are, are types of things where big influxes of sediment get carried downslope deeper into the ocean. Um, along uh, where maybe where rivers are coming in, there's a big influx of water coming in from a river off of land, or there's an undersea landslide, things of that nature. Um, and uh, you know the nearshore environment is that area between low tide and the storm wave base, uh, where where material is affecting the seafloor directly. Then there's the the surf zone where the waves break, called the foreshore area, acted upon directly by waves and tides, where the breakers are occurring. Um, typically, you get these kinds of strata in a beach environment. I'm less concerned about that for the most part, but just to know that it's mostly sand we're dealing with here. So you're going to end up with um, different kinds of waves hitting, longshore currents, uh, refracted waves, things of that nature. And of course, the, the, the characteristics of the beach you're talking about here, this is Nag's head, um, you know, are determined by the kinds of and, and the, the way the waves are interacting with that land. All right. And this is your shoreline profile at this location. You have dunes back shore, a berm, and then you have the berm crest near the edge of the, of the littoral zone, which extends out here, of course. Um, and then the foreshore area, longshore, the trough, which is a little deep area that then you, know, you get to a bar eventually, perhaps. And so that's too pretty typical. And again, here we go. There's a shore face area again where the berm scarp, that's about as high as the waves get, um, the high tide line and so forth. Um, all right, so longshore currents are, are derived actually because you've got the waves coming in at an angle, and that causes a creates a current along the shoreline that carries sand one direction or another, depending on the direction of the longshore current. But because these are striking the beach at an angle this way, the longshore current is forced in this direction. Um, and so these longshore currents can actually, when you go out to the beach and you're and you're hanging out, they'll actually carry you from one from one part of the beach here to another part of the beach. Before you know it, your towel's over here and you're over here. Um, you know, there's various ways that humans inter interact with the shoreline, which of course, all of these processes are affected by. We create jetties and, and uh, break walls and things of that nature to help us deal with the wave energy. So we can, of course, make new land or deal with, you know, create a bay. Um, you know, all of this has, to, all of this affects the ecosystems. And then of course, how we have to, do we may have to dredge the bay out occasionally because no longer, because now it's depositing sediment all the time. Um, we, can, we affect the coastline significantly. We create areas of deposition and at the same time create areas of erosion. And so like a groin, for instance, goes out from the sea, from the land, almost directly parallel, uh, and basically ends up with, on one side you get deposition, the other side you get erosion. Um, and so that's the, the natural effect of a groin. Um, you got other things like river dams and, and things that, you know, we can, of course, sometimes have to then take and bring in bring in sand from deeper out where we can replenish the beach. And that happens a lot, actually. Um, I mean, you don't see it happening, but they are doing that a lot generally. It beaches that are really popular. Sometimes you can get other things called longshore bars that get formed. Uh, you know, my favorite places to, to hang out are not in the deeper water. I like to hang out in the shallower water. So these are more interesting to me. I don't really enjoy swimming all that much myself, but... Um, you know, uh, and then of course there's different shoreline dangers. So sometimes you can get, you've all heard of rip currents and when you have the right, uh, the right conditions, you can create a rip current. Um, typically where the sandbars out have a break in them. And of course the, the breakers come in and hit the sandbar and then they come together with these feeder feeder currents that then bring you, and they can pull you way out to sea, of course. And so that's a pretty dangerous situation to be in. Watch your kids. Right. So if you're going to escape that, you have to get to swim to the left or swim to the right, basically. Uh, and then you can escape that. Waves, when they when they tend to interact with the shoreline, their effect is to try to straighten out the shoreline. And uh, wave refraction um, will act as a, as a weathering agent on the shoreline until it does that, until it straightens it out. Um, 
of course, leaving behind uh, things like uh, spits and uh, leaving behind things like uh, sea stacks and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> but some coastlines tectonically get lifted up out of the water and become what we call emergent coasts. These are, these are more common on the west coast than they are on the east because you have a subduction zones out there that are that lift up the overriding plate. And so the coastlines are emerging from the ocean. And then you have submerging coasts where the opposite is occurring, right? Out here, sea level is going up uh, much more much more rapidly than it is out west. Um, and of course, uh, it, as it moves up, places get inundated, uh, river mouths and things of that nature, because the coastline essentially is being submerged. Tidal flat zones are important uh, environments that are um, super tidal in nature. And uh, they have a tide, or the intertidal, I should say. The tide comes in during the day and goes out, and you get an influx of nutrients and so forth. But these are important environments for a lot of different organisms. And, uh, you know, they, they tend to make those grasslands. If you've driven out to east, the eastern shore of Virginia and over these, these long bridges where you see these grasslands with water, those are the, those are the tidal, tidal flat areas. Um, there's two, there's the two main types of continental margins. We live on along a passive margin where there's not really a whole lot of tectonics going on. Um, there's also, of course, um, active margins like the west coast of the U.S. The oceans themselves have currents moving through them. Surface currents, deep water currents, mid-ocean, mid-depth currents, and so forth. The surface currents are driven a lot at large time by by the by Hadley cells the in, in the atmosphere, um, which are the hot air rising, warmer air rising, cooler air um, sinking, um, and then the rotation of the Earth, the Coriolis effect, help drive some of this. It's like the Gulf Stream, which in part are driven by that, but also um, when it, when that water gets up here and cools off, it's uh, it tends to be saltier and colder, and will descend to the bottom of the ocean, where it'll come back down and make its way back up eventually once it warms. These surface currents are important for regulating the surface temperature in the Earth, and of course, as the Earth's continents have shifted around over time, uh, these currents have changed in their in their behavior and um, created you know what we have now. We can of course also look at the garbage patches that are out there. These are great pieces of evidence for um, surface currents. And there's like five of them out there in the ocean, actually. You see about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but there's a couple in the Atlantic and one out in the Indian and so forth. Um, these are these are produced because of the, these gyres and the surface ocean currents that we look at here. Um, there's a garbage patch here, one here, one here, one here, and one here, because there's gyres there, these circular surface currents. All right, so of course, currents affect climate. So the Gulf Stream comes from warmer waters and brings warmer waters up to Northern Europe. If this got shut off because of, say, an influx of fresh water or whatever, um, or melting ice, <laughs> uh, eventually that would plunge to northern Europe into a cold spill. Not a good thing for northern Europe. And that's because of what we all call the thermohaline circulation uh, belt, which is largely deep water currents. Um, these affect our, cl our, our climate here along the East Coast as well, keeping the East Coast pretty moderated in terms of temperature. And so that's important for us here too. Uh, but these are driven by, by density differences, primarily because of salinity and temperature. Colder water is more dense and salt, saltier water is more dense. Um, and not all the surface waters are the same density. And so some of them descend while others rise up. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a copy of this presentation already as well. So I'm going to kind of go through some of this stuff. Um, upwellings. The last topic I'll really kind of get into is some places along the coastline have more nutrients than others. Bottom water tends to be very nutrient rich. It's cold, but it's nutrient rich. And so especially along South America and the West Coast of the U.S., you get a lot of upwelling, which makes those waters really rich and really full of a lot of, a lot of sea life. Um, there are places where, they, where there's downwelling, and you get those nutrient-poor, warm surface waters that downwell on the coast. There's not a lot of fishing that goes on there. In times of El Nino, along the uh, West Coast of South America, what normally is nice, cold, upwelling waters, nutrient-rich waters, reverses the waters come from uh, further further west and move their way towards the shoreline that reverses and it produces bad fishing, but it also changes the climate regime. So El Nino, La Nina, those are important because of the shifts in currents, ocean currents going on and regulation of temperature. All right, tides. You've learned about tides before. What I'm going to go into briefly here is just talking about how we're going to use some tidal gauge stuff next week. Um, Right now, it's important to note that tides are caused by the by the pull of the Earth and the Moon, and mostly the Moon. And there's two tides per day because the Earth is rotating. 
So there's a tidal bulge on one side and on the other side of the planet at the same time. When the, when the moon and the sun are both pulling in the same direction, you get your biggest high tides, a spring tide during the month, um, and, your, and your lowest low tides, right? And then the other times when it's a first and third quarter moon, you get your um, you, you get your, other, your your opposite effect where they're pulling against each other. It's destructive interference is what, in terms of the uh, of that. And so some places, depending on the shape of the shoreline, will have a much bigger tidal range than others. Um, and of course, there's uh, the diurnal phases aren't perfect because they aren't every. It's not every single t every single same time of the day that you're always having ch tide changes, but you're getting you're getting two a day. Um, so some places like New Brunswick have extreme tidal ranges where, like the Bay of Fundy, you'll get a tidal range of forty to sixty feet. It's huge. It's not even a foot down at Virginia Beach, so very very significant. Um, so spring tides are where this is the, where the moon and the sun are lined up. Neap tides are where the half moon is opposite the sun. All right. Tsunamis, though, are like giant ocean waves. Tidal, the tidal wave, which we're looking at here, the, when the tides come in, that's a tidal wave. This is the tidal wave. Very, very different from tsunami, and I can't stress that enough. Tsunamis are like regular ocean wave, just a whole lot bigger. And then they go away eventually. All right, guys. That's long enough for this. Um, Read over the notes and read over the text, and we'll uh, have some fun with some data in class.